I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hello and welcome to the Ex-Mormon Files. Appreciate you spending a little bit of time with us. And we have a very interesting guest tonight who's come all the way from Tucson, Arizona. Billy Qualtro, we appreciate you coming up and sharing your story. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to have people here hear your story and tell us a little bit about your background. You, your family goes all the way back to Nauvoo, is that right? They do. Uh, my family on my mother's side was, was very tightly aligned with the Mormon Church from the very beginning. Wow. Part of their family, part of our family was there in Nauvoo. Uh, part of their family was converted in South Africa and traveled in a ship to the eastern United States and came across the plains wow. with the hand carts with the, one of the later migrations of the saints. And uh, my ancestors also were asked to settle St. George and then eventually were told to come down and settle northeastern Arizona. So there is a large pocket of Mormon pioneer heritage in northeastern Arizona mm -hmm. in the Eager Taylor area. And my and family that's where is from family. there. So did Brigham yeah. Young send them down there? I guess. Yes, he did. Or, yeah. Did Did your family write journals or keep records? Of, they of, did, of their experiences? and they they told some very amazing stories of crossing um, escarpments and going down uh, canyons with wagons and yeah. just things that were very uh, dangerous to do. It's kind of amazing how dedicated these people were to. Um, the, obeying what they were yeah, asked to do the by the sacrifices they made. Yeah. They did. So you were raised in the church then there in northern Arizona? or yeah. I was raised in the church and uh, I was born under the covenant. Yeah. My dad had been a Methodist and he met my mom when he was a forest ranger in northeastern Arizona and they got married and uh, he and my mom got sealed in the temple and I was Eventually born. Eventually he was converted to the church, I guess. And, yes. And uh, they got married where, in the Mesa Temple? In the Mesa sealed. Temple. Sealed in the Mesa Temple. Sealed in the Mesa Temple. So you were just a good active little Mormon girl, went to seminary and all that stuff, did you? <laughs> I did. Um, we, my family, both parents were active, held callings. We went to all of our meetings. We had family home evening. We had a piano. We sang all of the hymns. Uh, in the house constantly. Mm. Um, it's just your life. It was just, just our life. Yeah. And I was a very, very serious young girl. So to me, I was always listening, always thinking. Um, I knew that, that what we were being taught was very serious because it was clear to me that our salvation depended on our obedience and our right yeah. thinking. So even as a young child, I would event, I would sometimes <laughs> laugh in sacrament meeting, but most of the time I was really very serious. Did you notice the other kids being that same way, or were they pretty frivolous with their time? And I think there efforts? was a mixture. Yeah. <laughs> there was definitely a mixture. Um, I had one Sunday school teacher who did me a great favor, though. Uh, she taught the stories of Jesus, and I remember um, being very caught 
by the pictures and the story mm. of Jesus. And I remember the, the story that stuck with me the most that I, that I really loved was the story about when he was out on the Sea of Galilee and the picture that I had, I can still remember of it. Jesus oh. was out like this, <laughs> and he was calming. calming the storm, yes, yeah. and to me that was the great, powerful, mighty Jesus, and that's the one who kind of stuck in my heart. Wow, that's interesting. And as you, well, and we'll get into this in a bit, as you make your transition, that has even more impact on you, uh, who this Jesus really is, isn't it? it you know, is. you end up uh, uh, coming out of high school then. Did you, what did you do after high school? After high school, I went to Brigham Young University, oh. and uh, one of the, the, the stories that was real uh, important in my life, one of the, the cracks in Mormonism for me started before I ever hit high school. It started when I was a preteen, and I remember those were in the days of when David O. McKay was the prophet, and the the scripture that I remember most from that time is the glory of God is, is intelligence yeah. and light and truth. And that's on the entrance to BYU, isn't it? It uh, is indeed. Yeah. It is. The fact yeah. that I went to BYU <laughs> is not a coincidence because of that. Yeah. And my mother used to explain it like this, and it's, it's kind of a circular reasoning thing, but she would say, you don't have to worry about what is or isn't truth, because everything that is true is Mormonism, and everything that is Mormonism is true. So, <laughs> so if you just kind of stay within that circle, yeah. um, everything is okay. <laughs> and uh, my dad was a scientist. We um, talked about paleontology and all kinds of different things. The search for truth in our family was a big deal, yeah. but in this one arena, there was only one circular path to that truth. The, in religion, then. Yes. Yeah. Well, I know there's some criticism actually going on uh, about people being critical, critical thinking, you know, in the church, and and how whether people really do that or not. And, and I, I guess, in my opinion, they don't actually think critically about religion. They, like you say, they. All the other sciences, this they probably do, very intelligent people, but in the area of religion. But you notice, uh, did you have any questions or problems then through in your BYU time? And Before the BYU time, I had hit upon some significant things that were uh, troubling to me, and I went to BYU with the hope to be able to oh, find get, some get of those answers. answers. Yeah. So, I had had the opportunity to go to a bunch of different universities, and I chose to go to BYU because I figured if there was a place where I could, where the glory of God was intelligence, <laughs> where I could the go, faith and everything yeah, else, if yeah. there was a place where I could find the answer to the things that were troubling me, that's where I could go. Yeah. And uh, some of the things that were troubling me is in the in northeastern Arizona, it was kind of a little bit caught in the time warp when I was growing up. And so I would hear things like, and I know that, that in the 60s and the 70s that the church wasn't saying these things were still true anymore, but they were coming out from people in the congregation where I was, and it was being said that they were true. Things like... Um, men being on the moon. Some that of was, Brigham Young's quotes. Yeah, and stuff. some of yeah. those quotes. Some of the things that, that, that were being stated as true that bothered me a lot, that was the 60s and the 70s, and the idea that there was a whole race of people who were to be excluded from the privileges of priesthood and all of that stuff was very troubling to me. Yeah, the, the racial issue, yeah. And then I would have... Um, a Sunday school teacher or somebody say, the earth was created in six physical human days. <laughs> and and I, my dad was a scientist, my house was filled with books that showed fossils in layers and right. geological strata in layers. And so in a, in a very honest and not meaning to be obnoxious way, I would say, how do you explain this? And the first answer is, well, the earth is made up of pieces from another place and all of these things came from somewhere else and they got glued together in this earth. And I, 
I got a little bit <laughs> um, obnoxious. Yeah. And I said, wasn't it nice that Heavenly Father put all of these things in nice layers for us? <laughs> And and the Make person looked huh? yeah looked at me and then said what what became the truth that stuck in my mind about Mormonism, he said those things were put there to test your faith, oh, okay. and if you don't understand it you need to go fix yourself. Wow, and so the message began to become to come into me that if you are told by the church that something is true and it doesn't sit right with you you need to go fix yourself. Yeah. And so I would try to fix myself and try to fix myself. It <laughs> kind of closes off the discussion too, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it <laughs> does. It, yeah. it does. Well, you end up marrying a return missionary. I Is did marry right? a return missionary. Yeah. And uh, we began the process. We got married in the temple. Yeah. Um, I had another significant crisis of faith when we went through the temple. Mm -hmm. um, I was left with a very creepy feeling. You know, a lot of people have said that. It's, and you went through back when the... 1972. All the masonry kinds of things and the ways there. of taking your life and all that was still going on. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that is very strange. And some people, especially as... I think people that are more spiritually sensitive probably are kind of repelled or at least question what they went through. Did you feel like, well, I'll just understand it eventually? Or how did you deal with that? That's that's what I was told. But yeah. but what what was the truth to me is that if you are in the most sacred place in the world doing the most sacred work in the world yeah. and if these things are sacred shouldn't you feel this overwhelming sense of joy, joy. and happiness yeah. and peace because you are doing this wonderful thing i didn't feel that if if there had have been a way for me to sneak out the back door <laughs> i would have done it wow. because i just felt awful. Mm. And so I never did go back. And then of course the guilt there that you're the one at fault. You're the one that's not go trying fix hard yourself. enough. Go fix yourself. Go fix yourself. Yeah. Well so what happens next? You end up with a degree, a, a, computer a computer engineering degree or something like that, right? What is it? I did. <laughs> and uh, before that I'd, oh. I'd like to talk just a little sure. bit about what the, the path was. Um, the return missionary that I married was very charismatic. He, be, he was very powerful in the church. He had a lot of high callings. Mm. And uh, I found myself in the constant position of feeling like the fact that I didn't feel good about what was happening was my fault. Mm. And so I began this wild, chaotic process of I, my hus my my good husband, who is the husband who we'll talk about in a minute, um, <laughs> calls it squirming on the vine instead of the branch resting on the vine and taking sustenance from the vine. It's called squirming Squir on the squirming. vine. <laughs> so I had I many callings. <laughs> um, I had in in one case I had many callings in a small branch in Oregon. Well, you were a piano player too, and I know that adds a lot of a piano player assignments to the uh, primary president. Oh boy! Uh, I had some responsibilities supporting young women's and supporting Relief Society sure, and sure. doing other things, and I felt such a discontinuity, such a cognitive dissonance, a feeling of unhappiness and unsettledness inside myself that I would sneak out in between some of the meetings and go sit in the back of a Catholic church. Oh, really? Because in the back of the Catholic church, I couldn't feel the Mormon vibrations. And, and then I would go back and try again, and I tried and tried for many years. Wow. And uh, I did go back to school. I got a, an engineering degree, and uh, I knew that there were tremendous uh, problems in our family, not problems that were caused by the church at all. They were caused by a, a, a marital mismatch and yeah. some other pretty serious problems. But I knew I was going to have to take the kids and go earn my way in the real world, so I went and got a degree. And then our family had a, I call it the Big Bang since we were <laughs> scientists, and that family just, there was a critical emergency that took place the kids' safety was involved, and 
um, the marriage blew up and at the moment mm -hmm. that it blew up was my opportunity then to pull out of the church and try and figure out what I would do. But by that time I had committed 40 years mm. and tried everything that I knew how to do. Yeah. I had read the standard works backwards and forwards, upside down, been faithful in seminary, all of my callings. I held the temple recommend. I didn't go to the temple, but I held the temple yeah. recommend. I yeah. did everything that I could think of to do. And I felt uh, empty and cold and dissatisfied oh and... My goodness. And um, hopeless, very yeah. much. And, and always from a position of you're not doing enough, I guess, or you're, you're not accomplishing what you're supposed to be accomplishing. Is that part of it? <laughs> I think that I felt like I couldn't have done more, yeah. but nothing that I could do could change the fact that I couldn't stand up in testimony and say, I know that this is true. Yeah. And, and I had said that as a child. I had said that as a very young adult. Um, I did say it a few times as an adult, mm -hmm. but I, I, I didn't feel like everyone else did, and so I felt like it was mm. something was wrong with me. Wow. And uh, I went off to go and try and figure out what that was. <laughs> And I initially did what so many Latter-day Saints do when they leave. The structure is gone. The connection to the Bible is very weak. The knowledge of Jesus is pretty superficial. And You notice uh, that too. Yes, yeah, yeah. and we have no connection with any other Christian reality. Yeah, so it's, it's just either Mormonism or not. Or nothing. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems like that's kind of the way it goes. So I stepped out into the world and I, I, I tried New Age. I kind of went off the deep end and... and uh, <laughs> Which, as you say, is kind of typical, yeah. It is typical. Yeah. You're, you're angry, you're frustrated, you're disappointed, you're disillusioned, and you don't have anything to hang on to. Yeah. But I did have a picture in my mind of the powerful Jesus. Yeah. And so in the back of my mind, I, I knew that I needed to remake that connection, but I had no idea how to do it. Mm. Well, one thing before we get too far, and I'm not sure where this fits into your story, but you had someone share with you an, a concept of, oh, of yes. a circle. And I, I don't want to, we're actually, believe it or not, our time's just zooming by. And I wanted to make sure you included that in your, in your story today. Okay. I had a seminary teacher who once... Uh, described what I came to understand as the phenomenon that 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 blocks Mormons from reaching out and, and looking and inspecting any of the truths they have. He called it the inward facing circle. Yeah. And he said this as if it was a good thing. <laughs> he said that, that Mormons all gather together in this circle and they hold hands and in the middle of the circle are the truths of the restored gospel and they feast on those truths and they talk about it to each other and they share the joy of all of this inside the circle. And if someone approaches the circle, you turn for just a minute, you grab the hand of another person and you pull them into the inward facing circle. Mm. And in, it struck me as very odd because if you believe that all Mormonism is truth and all truth is Mormonism and yeah. the glory of God is intelligence, then why would you think that the truth could not be inspected and stand up to something? On its own, yeah. But if you are afraid to look outside of this information, then you are afraid that something out there might challenge something in there. Yeah. And so that's kind of a, was kind of a telling thing to me. And I think it also explains a little bit why people feel so warm and... Um, filled with this emotional feeling that we sometimes call testimony and it's it's kind of like we're in an echo chamber so we're all reinforcing of the good, each other we're always. reinforcing yeah. each other in this environment and there is love and there is meaning to be good and there is mm. sincerity and all of those things and so you feel that good thing in this context and you don't realize that that it's not an expression of anything that is tested truth. It's an expression of, of 
a group's cultural <laughs> connections to each other and intent. Yeah, interesting. Well, I, again, uh, just fascinating, but uh, tell us a little bit then about uh, life after, what, what kind of transitioned okay. you a little bit. And the path back to me is just an, an amazing thing because God is a gentleman, <laughs> uh, and I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> so um, he leads us. He doesn't frighten us into his arms. He leads us gently. And he went through a process with me. The first thing he did was help me reconnect after uh, a very sad divorce and a very sad family breakup to a very good man who was a Christian, very solid lover of Jesus Christ. And so even though I was out wandering around in the bushes <laughs> at that time, he, he said that he knew I would come back. Oh. And so he put his arms around me and he built me back up and got me to be able to trust my intuitions about these things, and it kind of started us on this path. Did he introduce you to a Jesus that you'd never met before? I know you started a Bible study. Uh, how important was that? The Bible study was really important. I went through, um, everywhere I went, I had a little foray inside the Methodist Church, and I felt like the Mormon in the Methodist Church. And then I went to the Presbyterian Church, and I would say, you guys are good people, and they'd say, no, we are good people, you're one of us. I was a Mormon in the Presbyterian Church. And then I showed up one day into a Pentecostal circle, and, and God bless if they didn't turn my little world upside down. Um, I was in a group of people who who believed that God was present in their everyday life in every real way you could imagine. Yeah. And they would say amazing things like, I'm heading over the mountain and God is going with me before my car and we will be safe. And I'm thinking... Just a trust in yeah, God Yeah, I'm and thinking Jesus you that... guys are really cute, but this is, <laughs> this is quite strange to me. And we would be discussing the scriptures and reading the scriptures and a woman would raise her hand and say, um, I feel like we should stop and praise the Lord. <laughs> and I would say, I don't know how to praise the Lord. We'll teach you how we'll to praise you. the Lord. So after some really wonderful experiences with these women who were women of giant faith, in my opinion, they said to me, we would like to make a challenge to you. We would like you to take off your Mormon glasses and go read the New Testament as if you were a little child. Mm -hmm and let God do the highlighting in your New Testament while you go instead of me taking out the little marker. Let Him do the highlighting in your New Testament and come back let and tell us what you think. Let Him bring out those scriptures that are important. And read as a, as a child. That's, yeah. That's awesome. Did you do that? I did that. I did that and I did it faithfully and I found myself doing it for hours at a time because it was just kind of a magical experience to me. And I began to see that all of the words that Mormons and Christians use that are the same words have very different, different meanings, meanings yeah. and that I had misunderstood the core of the New Testament. And the other thing that I learned is that as you read these things in context and you get to know the nature of the people who are doing these writings, the things that they had seen, the things the that they had yeah, lived with, the yes. first witnesses, yeah. that Jesus had been with them for 40 days after his resurrection, yeah. that Paul had seen the resurrected Lord. All of these things, they were, they went to England, they went to across Russia, they went to India, they went to Ethiopia, they, they did things that were amazing, and they were not country bumpkins. Mm. They were mortal men like we were with all of the faults that we have, but sure. they were um, so empowered by the fact that they had seen a risen Lord, they knew nothing could mm -hmm. hurt them, not really. Witnesses, yeah. And so off they went, and as you see this, the, the book began to emerge to me with power, mm -hmm. and I had what felt to me like a, like a conversion experience, but I had one left thing to get through, and that was I had a very deep fear because inside Mormonism, if you, if you don't do your temple work, if you don't believe the doctrines of the church, if you don't, aren't in compliance, if all of these things you risk never seeing God again, you risk maybe not seeing Jesus again, you won't be with your family, the Holy Spirit could withdraw from you. And so I 
was was going to go forward in faith, but I was uh, I was frightened, and so I told our the Mormon bishop in the ward that I lived at that time that I wanted my name removed from the records of the church, and he sent me back a letter where he threatened me with all of those things: you will never see God Lose again, the spirit you will and... never, you may never see Jesus again, you won't ever see your family again, you. Well, the Holy Spirit will withdraw from you, and you'll yeah. be alone all the days of your life. You, you have <laughs> dishonored your ancestors, and yeah. all of these things. Billy, and you wanted to take just a couple of minutes and talk to your family, so you've got a couple of minutes. Okay. If you would. So the time does fly back. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Well, the first thing I want to say is that that after the bishop had said that to me, I went out in the orchard and cried to the Lord, and He told me that. No one can tell me that I have to leave you alone and I've been with you always. So I walked off with peace and I would like to challenge anyone who is um, having issues with Mormonism or thinking about it or is a true proponent of the truth to take the same challenge that I did. Read the New Testament with your presuppositions disabled. Listen to the voice of God. Understand who it was that wrote those things. And don't be afraid. Don't let fear be the noise that stops you from having the courage to go through those exercises. And if you do, you will find a great peace and a great joy that doesn't compare to anything that you had before. And I am so thankful to God that He was willing to take me through that process. And we hope your family will listen to this. and sharing your joy and peace and there is such a freedom isn't there now you're the burden and the guilt's gone and i would say exactly the same thing about the new testament i had read it several times as a mormon but when i read it with eyes opened and i saw scriptures there that i'd never seen before well billy thank you so much for coming all this way to share your story and your delight and uh just, I'm just so grateful that we've had our eyes open, right? And and the peace that we have in, in these years of our life left and, and to have the joy. And, and what a, a blessing to have a husband who's such a support and an anchor. Yeah. Well, yes. thank you, Billy. I appreciate it very much. And thank you. Appreciate you, you watching and uh, tune in to other episodes. Uh, we appreciate you watching and we'll see you later. Good night.